Good morning and welcome to Sunday, August 28th. Can you believe that the year is, say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight months. We're almost into our ninth month. So we're better than halfway done. And for those of us who live in the south end of the San Joaquin Valley, it's near 100 again today and it's going down. We have a cooling trend, it's gonna be 99 tomorrow. <laughs> and then back up to like 100 again, so. But we live with that, don't we? And that's why we got air conditioning, which we're sitting in the middle of at the moment. Psalm six, hope is found when God removes all separations, plural. Oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your wrath. Instead, be gracious to me, O oh Lord, for I am pining away. O oh Lord, my bones are dismayed. My soul is greatly dismayed. David says, as bad as he feels in his body, his heart is even more agitated. But you, O oh Lord, so he turns from the trouble he's feeling and facing, and he looks and he says, but you, O oh Lord, and if you look, there's a little dash that's been printed because the, the idea is he's stopping for a moment and asking this question, how long? God, how long before you visit me? How long before you help me? How long before you respond? Return, oh Lord, rescue my soul. Save me because of your loving kindness. Not because I'm a good person, because I know I'm not. Not because I've done great things, because I haven't. Not because I'm worthy, but because of your loving kindness. Last night again, it was at night, I didn't sleep real well, and I was out in the living room and reading through the Bible. I've been reading through a great author. I got some quotes for him, from him in your bulletin in the sermon this morning. His name is Francis Schaeffer. Um, a bit of a tough read, but good stuff. And so I turned from that, I opened up this psalm, I knelt down, and I started praying. I read this psalm, and I prayed it. I believe in that fully and completely, taking God's word and praying it. And then I reached the point where I said this, God, if you don't help me, I don't have any help at all. And that's the, that is the absolute truth. If God doesn't help me, I have no helper anywhere until we all reach that point of recognizing our utter helplessness. That's what Jesus meant when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. That term poor in spirit is picture for yourself, a man sitting in the worst of places with nothing and reaching out his hand and begging for anything because he's got absolutely nothing. That's the word. Blessed are the people who recognize in the sight of God, I've got nothing good. I've got no hope without God. I've got no help without God. But with God, I have all things. David says, save me because of your loving kindness. For there's no mention of you in death. In Sheol, who will give you thanks? For those who pass out of this life, out of the presence of God, they will not be among those in heaven that give him thanks for what he has done. And I don't want to be in that company. I want God to rescue me through his loving kindness. And really, when I think about it, there's nothing I can add to God that makes him more glorious. I can't. He is already fully glorious and fully loving and fully wonderful. I don't change or make God greater. I don't do that at all. So what can I give God? <laughs> all I can give him is my thanks. And what does he want? He wants my thanks. That's all. He doesn't need it, but he deserves it. So David says, those in Sheol who give you thanks. I'm weary with my sighing. Every night I make my bed swim. What a picture. Uh, I've got a, a good friend that has a jacuzzi where he lives, 
It's a great big complex, not a lot of people use it. And he said, come on over and you can jump in the jacuzzi. And I said, give me about five minutes. <laughs> I get my back soaked inside that jacuzzi and then I jump in the pool and I'll, I'll walk the pool, I can't swim anymore. I'll walk the pool, but get some movement and whatnot. That's a, quite a word for David to use. If you're gonna make your bed swim, you must be crying a whole lot to make that happen. And sometimes we do. He says, I make my bed swim. I dissolve my couch with my tears. My eyes wasted away with grief. It's become old because of all my adversaries. And then he turns to his troubles and problems and the people who have caused him these troubles and depart from me, all you who do iniquity. And I want to say to the devil and to sin and to my trouble and my problems, depart from me. We need to tell him that. Get out of here. You got no business in my life. And until we decide to put our foot down, then we're not going to win that battle. We just have to say no. And it's a fight of faith. Paul uses that expression. He talks, the end of my life is near, he said, my being poured out like a drink offering. But I've run the race. I finished the course. I kept the faith. It was a fight. Your life of faith will be a fight because you've got someone who opposes you. You've got a world who opposes you. Depart from me, all you who do iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord receives my prayer. Isn't that great? He goes from how long, O Lord, to the Lord has heard, the Lord has received. And thus, verse 10, all my enemies will be ashamed and greatly dismayed. They shall turn back. They will suddenly be ashamed. There is a day coming when that will occur. All our enemies will be gone once and for all. Jesus Christ will return. People who have died in Christ will be resurrected from their graves. The Bible teaches that. God intended us to be people who live in human bodies. The problem is we live in broken bodies that need to be reclaimed, restored, redeemed, renewed, and he's going to do that. Amen. Talk about that in just a bit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful psalm, the hope that we find in the life of David, how he struggles and hurts and weeps and cries and is in pain, and then he prays and appeals to you, and you and your great loving kindness answer him. We ask your blessing on this word to us this morning, in Christ's name. Amen. I've changed my slide for just a moment for you. Here in church, you'll see online there are two cliffs. And then in church, I've placed a cross between the two cliffs. Because it's a demonstration of what God has done to take us from a place where we could not get across. It was impossible for me to cross from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son. I couldn't do it. I couldn't by myself cross from death to life. I couldn't do it. I can't. I need some. So the illustration is very simple. It's through the cross that we move from one to the other and only through the cross. Separation. The American Heritage Dictionary defines the word separation like this. It's the act or process of moving apart or forcing something apart. It's an interval of space that separates. It's a gap. There was a gap between Adam and God. Not when he was created. On the day he was created, there was a gap that was made when Adam took from the tree and ate. Suddenly, what was very good was no longer very good. David is experiencing separation. He puts his feelings, that sense of things, I, I am separated from what ought to be. I'm separated from what God wants things to be. And he puts it with these words. 
But you, O Lord, how long? Why this distance? Return, O Lord. Rescue my soul. How long? The how long questions begin when we're kids, actually. They don't start <laughs> when we're adults. It's like, how long before I can open my birthday presents? Or how long before we cut the cake and I can eat the cake? Or how long until Christmas? We used to have one of those little Advent calendars that we'd open up a little window on every day as we did a countdown. How long do I have to brush my teeth? Or this one, how long before we're home? Or how long until dinner? I'm going to starve to death. <laughs> how long do I have to sit in this time out? Eventually, those how long questions change to this. How long until I find someone who will love me? How long until the pain of this broken relationship goes away? How long will the chemo treatments take? How long does this grief last? How long until the pain is gone? How long? David knows that the Lord is his helper, but David feels that like there's just this great distance between him and his God. And he asks that question, but you, O oh Lord, how long? Return. Rescue me. There's this gap, a separation. Rescue my soul. Don't let there be any separation between you and me, Lord. I've just finished a singular book by Francis Schaeffer, Genesis in Time and Space. Or maybe it's Genesis in Space and Time, one of the two. The title makes it sound like one of those books that most people look at and go, mm, that's probably not going to make my top ten list. So I'll pick something else out, which is really too bad. It's an excellent book on the reality of the opening pages of the Bible. And so when Francis Schaeffer uses the term Genesis in space and time, <clears throat> what he's doing is telling us that God created space and time, that is stuff and time, and thus Adam was a real historical figure. It's not just a nice children's story. Eve was a real historical woman taken from the side of Adam. There was a reason why God made one man, and from that one man, out of the side of that man, created the woman. One man. Because there would be one man come along later who would come just from the woman. So originally, the woman was made just from the man, and there would be a second man come along who would be made just from the woman. And that first one man would stand as our representative. What he did, you did. What he failed, you failed. When he sinned, you sinned. When he died, you died. That's the historical truth. And Jesus points back to Genesis when he talks about marriage. He's asked how easy it ought to be to divorce. And he says, it wasn't intended so from the beginning. For God said, the two become one. And he's referring to a real relationship. Real people. Real time, real space, real history. He demonstrates, Shaver does, in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, it gives us the answers we need for the why and the how and the who of life. The great questions. Not how long before dinner, but why... Why do I exist? What is life about? Who is God? Who am I? Who are humans? Those are very important questions. Who am I as an individual living in this body? Where did the body come from? Why the struggles with pain and illness? Why death? The first 11 chapters answer those questions. Who is God? Answers that question also. How did... Did the world get to the place we're at today? It answers that question. 
Where's the help found for the world in the situation it's at today? It answers that question also. All of them in the first 11 chapters. It's amazing. And he just simply lays it all out and says, the promise God made, the seed of the woman, was a real promise to a real person telling us that one day another real person would come along of just the woman and he would rescue us. He would crush the head of the serpent. And in doing so, he would take a bite on his heel. He would. But that bite, he would absorb himself and then overcome it and be raised from dead. The book of Genesis tells us how God made everything and it was all good. Humans were not separated from God when he made Adam and Eve, nor from each other, nor from their purpose, nor from the nature that they were pulled out of. So Adam's body was taken from the ground, that's nature which God had made. But God did something remarkable. He breathed into that body of his spirit, shared with us his self, his image, and suddenly that body became a living soul. That's historical. That's what gives every human being value. Not because people say you have value or you don't. The government isn't the one that has the right to determine who has value nor any laws that they pass. We even recognize in our Constitution that there are certain inalienable rights given to us by God. Life, liberty, and the pursuit, happiness. Notice I'm so glad they didn't promise the government would make us happy. They're trying to do that now, doing a pretty poor job of it, in my estimation, because people will never be happy. There's never enough that the government give, can give to them and do for them. I read something wonderful on the Babylon Bee. It's a humorous, satirical website. Pokes fun at Christians, too. A little bit of fun. And it said the gender studies grads, average annual income was zero dollars. But after this last week, their average annual income is now $10,000 because the government just gifted them $10,000. Yeah. Uh, and that's our tax dollars. <laughs> yeah. So how much more do you want the government to do for you? The book of Genesis, it doesn't use the word separation, but it shows it perfectly what happened. Suddenly, Adam separated from God. How do we know? He hides, he runs, he hides. God didn't want it that way, but that's what Adam did. God came to fix that separation, however. And the first question is, Adam, where are you? Why are you in hiding? He says, I was, saw I was naked. I can now see what I look like without your covering of this holiness of your spirit. I can see who I am now in my sin, and I'm ashamed. I gotta hide from you and I gotta cover myself, and now I gotta hide from people. Sin causes us to hide from one another. We're ashamed of ourselves. We're afraid. Where are you? Who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree? of which I commanded you not to eat from? Then the next separation is the separation of the man and the woman, relational. His response to that question, did you eat from the tree, is the woman that you gave me. <laughs> she took and ate. And he turns to the woman, what is this that you've done? And her statement, the serpent, beguiled me. And he turns the serpent and he's done asking questions. Now the Lord God is going to step in and tell the serpent and the woman and the man, now this is how things are going to be. This is it. It's how things are going to be. 
serpent, you're cursed. You go about in your belly and crawl and eat dust. To the woman, this blessing of childbirth, that joy that you do have, will now have pain. And that pain will not just be in the birthing process, but moms, as you know, that pain can last into your children's adult years. This is real history. It's not just a nice story. When you read Romans chapter 5, you'll see one man sinned, died, we all sinned, died. One man obeyed, and his obedience becomes ours also because he's our substitute, just like Adam was our substitute, our representative. Once Adam and Eve ate, they suddenly experienced the reality of what God never intended. He never intended it. They're now separated. The man was now separated from the ease of providing food for himself and his wife. Prior to this, he was to tend and keep the garden. I would assume it would be enjoyable, creative, productive. But now, what it will produce, thorns and thistles. For the earth that he was taken from will no longer be his friend. The ground is cursed. Notice, not the man. The ground is cursed. And so now the ground cannot fulfill its function either. And Paul tells us in the book of Romans that God subjected creation to vanity in the hope that it would be redeemed. It's an amazing story. The book of Genesis is so amazing. And Paul takes the truth, the reality, the historical truth of it in Romans 5 and Romans 8 and talks to us about the future, talks to us about the past, talks about the one who bridges the two, Jesus Christ. The man now would be marked with sweat and toil. He would be separated from the joy of the ease of work, and instead, what was added to his life was sweat. Eventually, they would both experience the separation of the person of Adam and the person of Eve from their physical body. That's called death. They would be separated from their body. But worst of all, the most terrible separation was yet to come. Eternal separation. It's not what God wants. It's what happens when people reject God, refuse to believe him, won't respond to the gospel, are just hardened against all of it. Eternal separation. That means never being with God forever. It's a refusal to respond to God with trust as Adam and Eve were supposed to do. The response to, did God say, should have been, yes, he did. He didn't mean it, yes, he did. Well, the day you eat, you'll become like God's. No, we won't. That should have been the discussion, but it didn't go that way. And so now eternal separation lies in the future. I thought of an illustration of how to answer people's statement that they plan on getting into heaven even though they're not making plans on getting there. You know, you talk to people about heaven and hell and the future and hope and Christ and salvation and all of that, and they'll give several different answers, you know, like, I'm a good guy, right? I'm not a bad person. I've never murdered anybody, and I haven't done this. I've done a few stuff, and so I'm hoping... One day, God will kind of throw my life on a, on a balance, and hopefully the good will outweigh the bad. And the answer to that is real simple. Go in front of a judge when you've been ticketed for speeding and tell the judge you're a really good guy, and so he ought to toss the ticket because of that. Yeah, see how far you get with that. Bailiff toss this guy in the jail until he pays his ticket. That isn't how justice works. That's a real simple answer. The other one is, well, I, I just know I'll get there, but what kind of plans are you making to get there? Well, none, really. So here's my question then, my illustration. Just consider someone plans to visit London or Paris or pick a city, Rome, 
Just pick one out of the U.S. Can't be in the U.S., got to be outside of the country. Okay? Heaven is not here, heaven is outside the world. All right? Now, those plans would include the necessity of getting a passport. Right? Without one, they're not going to let you into the country. You would need a ticket for travel. Doesn't matter how you get there, boat, plane, somehow you need a ticket for travel. And you need to pack everything that you're going to need for the trip, right? That takes preparation, takes thought, it takes planning. People are not going to magically end up in London or Paris or Rome or wherever without any type of plan or preparation. That's not going to happen. You won't just suddenly be picked up and magically transported over to London. You have to prepare for it. We need a way of getting into heaven. How can you get into heaven without any planning? It can't be done. The book of Genesis tells us that there is a plan. God has prepared that plan for us, and he's prepared everything that's needed. In the book of Genesis, in the third chapter, here's the plan. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. That's the plan. Do you believe that? There's not a lot of clarity in those early days. The clarity would come later. But I'm a full, for myself, I believe fully that Adam and Eve are in heaven. And here's my reasoning. Number one, God provided the sacrifice, the first one that they needed. He showed them from now on, it's going to take the death of an animal for you to approach me. That was just substitutionary. It couldn't ever take care of what Adam had done. But it was looking forward. And then the skin of that animal was placed around them. And so in the New Testament, you understand that substitute was a lamb of God, Jesus. And it's his blood that pays for us because it's human blood for human sin. And we're clothed with Christ, aren't we? Paul uses that word. We're clothed in his righteousness, covered in that. So that wonderful picture began. And we read then that Abel offered a better sacrifice by faith. What did he offer? Of the flock. How did he know to offer of the flock? Because his father taught him. Adam teaches his sons. And Cain refuses. Cain knows because God confronts him. He knows, but he refuses to do it. He rejects it. And Eve, before the fall, she's just called the woman. Read through Genesis. She's not called Eve until after the fall. Her name in Hebrew is Chava. That word comes from the Hebrew word for life. So the man now names the woman Eve because she's the mother of all the living. Go read it. She hasn't had a child yet. He is now expecting that the promise that God made, the seed from the woman, will bring us life. And so she's the mother of the living, which she would be. I know through many generations. But the point is Jesus Christ comes from Eve, who comes from Adam. It's a promise God made. It's found in this historical book. Back to the psalm now and how David appeals to the Lord to remove these separations he feels. So, number one, we've been separated from God. Number two, we've been separated from one another relationally. Number three, we've been separated from the health and the well-being of our body by sickness and death. Number four, we've been separated from nature. God's going to restore all those things. He restores unto himself. He restores relationships among people. He restores us with a new body and he's restoring a brand new heavens and a brand new earth. He's going to fix all this. God said he's going to do it. So what does David have to say? Well, first, David knows he's done something wrong. What it is isn't spelled out for us in this psalm, which actually is good because I think it was Charles Spurgeon, perhaps, and other preachers said this very simply. If David had confessed a particular sin, we would feel those words can't apply to us because that's not my sin. But since David didn't confess some particular sin, whatever my sin is fits in the blank. 
Now, the New Testament clarifies that in a greater fashion. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there's the fill in the blank, one fits all. But it's good to see through here, you can fit yourself in David's place. Whatever I've done can be inserted. Here's how David describes his feeling. Pining away, which means weakness, sickness, or sadness and depression. Dismayed, that word dismayed means agitated, troubled, sighing, tears, grief. All those are common to human beings at some time in our lives. And maybe you're feeling those this morning. And so God invites you to tell him about it and invites you to ask him how long and invites him invites you to say to him return to me O Lord he invites you to do that number two David appeals to the Lord's loving kindness to remove the separation any sin may have caused return O Lord rescue my soul save me because of your loving kindness that's the ground that's the, the reason that we ask God to forgive us because of his loving kindness his goodness well, we celebrate that Sunday by Sunday and my faith is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame that's a building or structure but instead wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. David then asked the Lord to heal him. In other words, remove the separation that's been created between me and a healthy body. The final end of sickness is death. And that's when you will be taken out of your body. Your body and you will be separated. Sickness is that process. So David is asking God to step in and stop that, at least for the moment. For now, God, heal me, he says. Oh, Lord, my bones, that's his physical body, they're dismayed. I'm feeling this pain, this agitation inside my body, and I need you to heal me, God. One of the great marks of the Pentecostal movement, it actually grew from two separate great Christian movements. The first one was a holiness movement, and the second one was a healing movement. It combined the two of them together in Pentecostalism. Four, David wants a clear separation from his adversaries, from all those who do him wrong. It's found in verse eight. Depart from me, all you who do iniquity. He's not wanting nor willing for them to affect his life any longer. They've troubled him enough, he'd say. I'm done with it. Get away from me. Go. And that's, we need to love people. We need to love people. God loves people. But I want to be separated from things that are causing me trouble and I just don't need to be a part of my life. Depart from me. Lastly, David celebrates the Lord answering his prayer. The Lord has heard my supplication. The word supplication is an intense word for prayer. So prayer is talking to the Lord. Supplication is really, really talking to the Lord. It's intense. The Lord receives my prayer. That, I, like, I really like that word. He receives it. He's got it. He's heard it. He's welcomed it. All my enemies will be shamed and greatly dismayed. They shall turn back. They shall, sh they shall suddenly be ashamed. So we can read this psalm in several minutes. It doesn't take long. However, sometimes the fullness of the Lord's answer to our prayer does happen immediately. Sometimes it doesn't. David, at least for a time, don't know how long, but for a time, made his couch swim with his tears, he says. How long was that? I don't know. But it was long enough for him to say, I can't take this anymore. Please, God, 
How long? Please, God, rescue me. Please, God, return to me. And the Lord answers his prayer. Sometimes we weep overnight, sometimes longer. But we know that the Lord hears our prayer when we pray. He hears it. And when he hears it, we know he will answer it. We will be delivered from our enemies, starting with sin, then sickness, then dying, then death. Jesus defeated those enemies on the cross and through his resurrection from the dead. Ascended into heaven and now sits at the right hand of God where all his enemies will be placed under his feet. Do you believe that? That's the question. Jesus had been told, Lazarus, your friend whom you love, is sick. He needs you. Jesus waits several more days. Then he tells his disciples, we need to go. And he says, Lazarus, our friend, is asleep. And their response is like I would have been too. Well, if he's sleeping, he's been sick, he's sleeping, that's good. And then he says, Lazarus is dead. It's, what he, it's how you understand it. God looked at it as sleep because this is a believer. Lazarus is a believer. So he doesn't fall dead, he falls asleep. But we go. And so as he reaches just the outskirts of the village of Bethany, Mary and Martha, two sisters, have no doubt been discussing. We told him, didn't we? We let him know. He didn't come. So Martha's the type A. Mary's the stay at home and visit the feet of Jesus. Martha can't wait. She goes running out to meet him, and her first statement is, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She's just straight, right up front. Then she fo follows that with, but even now, I know. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. He'll live. And she says, I know in the resurrection he will. I believe that. And Jesus said, you don't understand. The resurrection is standing in front of you. I'm the resurrection. I'm the one in whom Lazarus has life. I'm the one that has power over that separation from Lazarus and his body. And in just a few moments, he would exercise that power. Martha goes running back to tell Mary. And she, she embellishes a bit because the story doesn't say that. She says, the master's calling for you. I think it was her way to get Mary out there. So... Mary goes out and she has the very same statement. Lord, if you'd been here. And then Jesus weeps. Shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus sees what has happened to these people. And he knows how painful it has been for them to experience this. But it had to be. Why? So that people would believe. There had to be a demonstration of his great power over death in the life of his friend Lazarus. Sometimes God will ask us to go through hard times that he might demonstrate something greater in our life to prove who he is. I think it was Andre Crouch said, if you never experienced any mountains, you'd never know God could move them. Never know. If you never experienced any troubles, how would you know God could fix them? So does the Lord cause that? No, he doesn't. Does he allow it? Sometimes. And sometimes your couch swims because of your tears. But the Lord has heard and received. God has promised one day, death, dying, sickness, pain will be removed. He will separate these things from us forever. He's done it as he's taken the separation between us and him away and joined us through Jesus Christ to himself. And so, 
I've talked about the first book of the Bible and David's experience in Psalms, and now we're going to turn to the last book of the Bible and see the statement that God makes, which is just as historically true yet to be, but it will be history one day. What is it? I heard a loud voice from the throne. From the throne. Notice where the voice comes from. It's the center, the king, the ruling place of the universe. Saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. God now dwells among us. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. That was his intention when he made the man and the woman. They walked away from it. He has come to take that separation and get rid of it. And he's done it through Jesus Christ. And this is looking forward to the day when there will be no distance between us and God. For you shall see him face to face. In this body, we can't. But one day, in our brand new body, we will. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. God himself will be among them. And what will he will wipe away every tear. Not another one. He will. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. How do you know? Because he who sits on the throne. He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And so he says to John, Write these things down. Take that book and write them in the book. Let people read it. Let them hear it. Let them believe it. I'm making all things new. Right, these words are faithful. They're true. And then he said to me, it's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. It's like it's finished. When Jesus was on the cross, it's finished. It's done. It's irreversible. It's done. I've declared it. It's going to be. And then he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. You don't have to pay for it, is what he means. You get the water of life freely. Just got to ask. The woman at the well, when Jesus asked her for a drink, was willing. And then Jesus responds, if you knew who was talking to you, you'd ask him to give you living water free, without cost. If you drank of that, your soul would never thirst again. Behold, I make all things new. Write these words of faithful and true. It's done in the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I'll give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things. I will be his God. He will be my son. But for the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, their part will be in the lake of separation lake that burns with fire and brimstone that is the second death the first death is physical the second is eternal I don't know who wrote it but I remember hearing something remarkable you're born once and die twice or you're born twice and you die once you're born physically, you die physically, separated from God, you'll die eternally. You're born once, you're born again, you die physically, never die spiritually, eternally. Do you believe this? That's God's word. It's faithful, it's true. This morning, would you bow your head for a moment and just... And ask you, do you need to tell the Lord about your, your hurts, your pains, your struggles, whatever it is. Whatever it's causing you to feel hurt, dismayed, agitated, sighing, all that you're going through. Tell him about it. And like David, you know, he, he's, he talks honestly with God. How long, Lord? It's hard. How long, Lord? Rescue me. Please help me. Return to me, Lord. And then the end of the psalm, 
is very clear that he knows God has heard his prayer. He states that. This morning, I want you to know, I want you to not leave until you know God's heard your prayer. Please, stay until you know God's heard your prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love given to us in Jesus Christ, for the historical accuracy of the Bible, its truth, and the promise that one day you will remove from us, you will separate from us, sin, sickness, dying, and restore fully our relationship with you, with each other, and with the brand new heavens and earth. No more separation ever. You will be our God. You will dwell among us. We will be your people. Through Jesus Christ, we praise you for this and we thank you in his name.